Hello, welcome back. Global warming poses a grave threat to our way of life, or to put it another way, our way of life, if it goes on unchecked, poses a grave threat to the planet. Last year's forum shed light on the grave macroeconomic and financial implications of our efforts to cut carbon emissions to mitigate the impact of climate change. But today we're going to ask, how do those challenges affect central bankers' decisions? For a topic of such magnitude, there's relatively little research on this. Today's second session seeks to rectify that. I'd like to now introduce the session chair, ECB executive board member, Frank Elderson. Mr. Elderson, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Claire, for your kind introduction. And let me take this opportunity also to thank the staff involved in the organization of this year's ECB Forum. In spite of the circumstances requiring us to have this year's forum again as an online event, um, staff has managed to put together an impressive program with highly topical papers and distinguished speakers. And, and I am honored to moderate one of these sessions. As indeed mentioned by Claire, last year's ECB Forum featured a discussion of macro financial implications of climate change and decarbon transition. Climate change and decarbon transition, the development that the president in her opening address yesterday referred to as the most important yet least explored trend. Today, in this session, we bring this crucial topic to the core of central banking, monetary policy. In July, the ECB announced, as part of the outcome of its strategy review, a climate-related action plan to incorporate climate change considerations in its monetary policy. A roadmap with several areas of work, including macroeconomic modeling and changes in the operational framework for monetary policy implementation. As always, in conducting this work, we will be facts and evidence-based. This is one reason why the ECB is a very active participant in the central banks and supervisors network for greening the financial system. Um, central banks and supervising, uh, and banks supervising and, and exchanging views, this is what we do in the NGFS, and share practices on how to incorporate climate-related and environmental considerations in the pursuit of our mandates. But as so often has been in the case of human history, to make real progress, policymakers need to stand on the shoulders of giants. And we are very much aware that those shoulders typically can be found in the research community. And therefore, I am without a doubt that the paper and discussion in this session will be supportive to the work that we are so actively engaging in. I'm very happy to introduce to you the presenter of this session, Professor Warwick McKibben from Australia National University. And I actually recommend all participants and listeners to visit the forum website to take note of the impressive CV of Professor McKibben. He has worked on a wide range of topics on applied macroeconomic analysis and public policy. And here I want to draw attention to the CEPR report that he contributed to, released in September, providing a very comprehensive a thorough and, might I add, timely review of the outcome of the ECB strategy review. Today, Professor McKibben will present some of the analytical work that informed also the CEPR report, which is already a testament to the policy relevance of his work. <laughs> 
The paper has been jointly produced with Professor Beatrice Veda Di Mauro and Maximilian Conrad, both from the Geneva Graduate Institute. Warwick, we look forward to your presentation and the floor is yours for 20 minutes. Great, thank you so much for such a kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you to the ECB for allowing me the opportunity to present this joint research with Beatrice Weta de Moro and Maximilian Krondat. Um, what I'll do very briefly, um, I only have 20 minutes, so I will be giving a quick overview of the paper, uh, present some empirical results on carbon taxes and inflation and output in Europe. Very, very briefly discuss a global model that we've developed for analyzing climate policy and monetary policy interactions and present some results looking at a number of different monetary rules and how they respond to global climate shocks, which is physical risk, climate policy changes in the euro area, which is transition risk, and transition risk from the global level where we undertake global climate policy. Um, I've already mentioned the, the structure of the paper, but the goal is to, to look at the firstly the empirical evidence on what has impacted on output and inflation from countries within Europe that have implemented carbon taxes since 1985, and then to look forward using this global economic model to explore climate shocks, climate policy, and the importance of the central bank reaction function in responding to these particular outcomes. Um, starting with the empirical work, if you look at the uh, carbon taxes, there's been a number of countries, as you would be aware, have had carbon taxes uh, since 1985. Uh, varied across countries, uh, implementation at different points, at different rates, and different coverage in the economy. What we do in the first part of the paper uh, is firstly do the econometric analysis. We follow the approach of Metcalf and Stock. It was in the, um, in the AR very recently in 2020. And what we're doing is estimating an equation of the form that's on the screen. The change in various price concepts, in this case, we're using the CPI, but we look at a whole range of different measures of inflation. And we regress this on tau, the real carbon tax in each country, I, the lags of the carbon tax, and the lags of the change in the CPI, and we allow for unobserved heterogeneity specific to countries and years. And so the idea here is to, to calculate what's significant and what's the sign of these different effects. And again, there's a lot of work has gone into this part of the paper. Let me very briefly summarize it. Here are one example for GDP and two different definitions of, of CPI, headline CPI and call CPI. And what we find is if you just run country fixed effects, uh, the impact in the first year of the carbon tax on GDP is negative, and then that eventually dissipates over time. If you incorporate the reaction function of the central bank and as additional country and time fixed effects, you find the sign changes. So the best estimate here is that uh, carbon taxes across countries and across time have marginally raised GDP, although it's fairly insignificant. Um, also, in terms of the CPI, um, the CPI, with a core CPI or headline CPI, the carbon tax, when you adjust for the various factors on, in the regression, uh, either has a small negative impact or a small positive impact, uh, but eventually the inflation effects um, dissipate. And just to give you an idea, when you look at some of the impulse response functions, here we're perturbing the carbon tax uh, 40 euros uh, a tonne, and we find that there's a slight increase in GDP with an enormous amount of uncertainty. And if you look at the responses to CPI, you see it's varying around zero uh, in terms of core CPI, and again, with very large confidence bands. So that's the history. Um, carbon taxes do impact on the economy, on the real economy, as well as inflation, but it varies across countries and it varies across time. Looking forward to carbon taxes that we're likely to observe, and the climate shocks are likely to be larger than what we've seen in the historical record. So we moved to a simulation model. The model is called G-cubed. Uh, it's well documented. It's appeared in the handbook of CGE modeling with my co-author, Peter Wilcoxon, uh, and it's widely used in the CGE, dynamic CGE literature, much less inside central banking uh, until now. What is the G-cubed model? Well, it's a hybrid of the DSGE, the stochastic dynamic general equilibrium models that we find in central banks and the much larger scale computable general equilibrium models that are largely used for trade and tax policy issues. What's important in G-cubed is that it models the linkages across sectors of the economy, across countries, 
It models international capital flows. It models intertemporal decision making on consumption and investment. And it's very dynamic. The, de the dynamics are at the sectoral level. It's an annual model. And there's a lot of frictions in the short run, and this is very important. Long-term equilibrium models are used for, for asking questions about long-run equilibrium. Integrated assessment models are very useful for answering questions about long-term technology issues. But to look at the macro environment in the face of climate shocks, you do need a time frame of 10 to 30 years, which has the real-world dynamics that come from labour markets, adjustment costs and capital accumulation, and the lack of mobility of labour across countries. And very importantly, the GQ model has very specific fiscal rules for government spending and taxes. These matter a lot, both for the impact of monetary policy and the impact of climate policy. They also have, for every country, specific monetary rules, which also matter in the short term for the impact of climate shocks, climate policy, and the impact of government spending changes. So the monetary rules matter in the short to medium term, uh, in the modelling that doesn't matter so much in the longer term. Now, what we did for this paper was we uh, in, created a, a new version of the model. For most of the analysis we've done for the Paris Accord and uh, other international agreement analysis for different countries, we always had Europe as an aggregate um, group of countries, including the UK. What we've done for this specific paper is pull the UK out and the non-Eurozone countries and put them in the rest of the OECD or rest of the advanced economies, and specifically just included the countries that are in the Euro area. Uh, the model itself has a lot of disaggregation, and this is very important uh, for central bankers who are worried about modelling climate change policy, because climate change policy and climate shocks are about relative price changes. Um, in this model, we have 20 sectors in each region, so there's 200 different uh, firms producing in different countries. Uh, we have the model, the region divided up into energy sectors, so there's five primary energy sectors, one of which is electricity delivery, and the electricity delivery sector is using inputs from all the different technologies, coal, oil, gas, nuclear. And then we have the rest of the economy divided up into another seven sectors, which are quite conventional um, manufacturing, agriculture, services. It's important to capture not just the disaggregation on the energy system and not just the disaggregation of electricity technologies, but also the interaction and the change in behaviour of, of firms in these different sectors in the economy, because it's not just the uh, incentives on the energy side that matter, it's the change in the relative prices of the energy as it's entering into other parts of the economy. It's very important to capture those relative price effects. Um, for those who are a little bit more technical, this is the exact production structure that we use in GQ. Um, each sector, this is just one particular sector, let's call it agriculture, um, it has inputs of energy, capital, labour and materials. The energy inputs are a composition of, of, of clean energy coming from different electricity generating technologies, pet refined petroleum and the sectors that emit the CO2, which we're focused on, coal, oil and gas. Each sector and each country has different shares of these inputs, and each uh, sector within a given country have different elasticities of substitution. And very important to stress that it's not just the elasticity of substitution within energy that matters, it's the elasticity of substitution across all production in the economy. The other aspect which is very important is think of this as a consumption nesting for the household. Same sort of nest, households use energy, capital, labour, material, when you change carbon taxes, it changes the relative prices of the bundles of goods that households consume and it changes their behaviour. And that's important when designing climate policy. You need to change the behaviour of all the actors in the economy because the more parts of the economy that can react, the less costly the policy will be. So that's a brief, very brief overview of the, of the modelling framework. Um, how do we do this? Well, firstly, it's complicated. <laughs> What we first do is generate a world starting from 2019 to 2100. We assume that the climate policies that were in place in 2018 don't change. So there's no international agreement. This is what a continuation of the world from 2018 would look like. And what's important is the assumptions about population growth by country, productivity growth by country and sector, technology assumptions, policy rules. There's a lot of assumptions that have to be made in doing this sort of scenario analysis. Again, we're not trying to do a prediction here. We're trying to learn the complexity of the interactions uh, it, when, when we're dealing with climate change and monetary and fiscal policies. So to be very clear, we assume that in 2021, 
people start to understand that these climate shocks are coming. Not only the climate shocks in 2021, but they understand what the distribution might look like in the future. They also, when we model climate policy, we're assuming that there's a credible agreement in 2021 and countries will stick to the policies that have been agreed to and implement them using carbon taxes. Um, very important, the revenue assumptions that you use with the carbon tax, and I'll touch on that shortly. Um, once we get into the future, agents know what's coming, although not everybody knows it completely. So in the model, households and firms are divided between those that look at the current economic activity, the 30% of firms, uh, sorry, 70% of firms are looking at a current economic situation, 30% of firms and households are looking forward, informing expectations based on this future simulation results of the model. The two monetary rules we look at, and we, in fact, you could look at many, many different policy rules, normal income targeting, price level targeting. We chose two in particular because there's too many combinations and permutations of, of um, assumptions you can make. The two that we make is one is a, is a Hartman-Smets rule, um, which is uh, published in the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity. And this says that the ECB follows an interest rate rule where the change in the interest rate is equal to the coefficient on inflation expected one year ahead relative to desired inflation one year ahead, plus the coefficient on the growth rate expected next year relative to the desired growth, growth rate uh, next year. So that's deemed by the authors to be a good representation of ECB monetary policy up until 2018. What we then do in an experiment is say, well, that's a lot of forward lookingness in that rule. What if we change the rule so that we have half of current information and half of future information in the rule? So the idea here was to see how important it was to use contemporaneous information of what's happening in the economy rather than expected future information. And so we call that the modified hartman smets rule. Now, there's a lot of analysis behind this paper and appears in other papers we've published this year. Um, the first thing we do is come up with a, a develop a set of climate shocks following uh, Roshan Fernando, uh, Larry Lowe and my own paper uh, earlier this year, where we look at climate risk scenarios and we distinguish between chronic climate change, which other studies have looked at, that is the impact on productivity growth gradually over time from the changes in temperature trends and the impact of those temperature trends uh, on uh, essentially productivity. Uh, and then we actually implement this new approach of looking at extreme climate events. These are hurricanes, cyclones, floods, uh, droughts, um, forest fires. And so we, we distinguish between these types of events um, and it turns out that uh, it, it has a big impact. Now, in terms of, in that paper, we looked at all, all the various representative concentration pathways. These are different assumptions about what the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere will be by 2100. What we're doing in this paper is we're picking just one of them, which was RCP 4.5. And this is the assumption that CO2 concentrations stabilise at 650 parts per million by 2100. That'll give you about 2.4 uh, degrees warming by 2100, which would be consistent with the fact that there was no policy implemented uh, in the baseline. And so we're trying to incorporate that. Now, I won't go through the climate shocks in detail. Uh, there's a few interesting results here, but I'll talk about them shortly. The first thing to note is in terms of Europe, again, the, all the graphs I'll present will be percent deviation from what otherwise would be the case. That is, you generate the baseline, you implement the shocks or the policies, and I'm showing you the difference between the two. And I'm showing you the difference between the two across the modified hartsman spets rule and the hartman smets rule. And you can see that the main point from this chart is that these climate shocks will have long-term effects on the GDP relative to what it would have been. This is not the GDP growth rate, it's the GDP level. It will tend to depreciate the European exchange rate and it will tend to permanently lower real interest rates uh, in Europe. Now, that that's a very quick overview because uh, there's a lot we can talk about in the uh, in the discussion. What's the policy we follow? The policy is suppose Europe alone implements a carbon tax in 2021 at 50 euros per tonne of CO2, which is currently actually below the current uh, European trading system price uh, by 10 euros a tonne. And this tax rises by 3% per year in real terms. Now, what does it do to the economy? These are again, deviations from what otherwise would be the case. On the left, these are the energy prices, and you can see the biggest impact is on coal. Coal price jumps up and then tends to rise at the rate of increase in the carbon tax. And the other energy prices rise as well. 
Uh, in this case, I'm just looking at the modified Hartsman-Smets rule. I'll come back to what the Hartsman-Smets rule does shortly. But what you can see is that some prices move up and actually some prices move down. This relative price fall is in construction. So there's a sufficient slowdown in construction in Europe that it causes the price of construction to fall. But these relative price changes across non-energy and across energy sectors are, are fairly significant. What happens then under the two rules? So here we have um, the Europe GDP. Again, the modified Hartmann-Smets is, um, uh, sorry, Hartmann-Smets, we get this big fall in GDP. What the central bank in that rule is looking at isn't the fall in GDP growth rate, it's looking at the increase in the growth rate a year later. And so it interprets that as a reason to tighten monetary policy because the growth rate is above desired. That causes a tightening of policy, which causes a slight dip in inflation and then a recovery. When you do the modified Hartsman Smets, you know that the economy is going through this year a contraction. So you don't tighten policy as much because you're using current information. So you can see in the short term, the effects are quite different in those two types of rules. And inflation can be higher or lower depending on which rule is in place very consistent with the empirical results. What does it do about the to the short-term trade-off? This chart shows you the change in inflation relative to the GDP change in Hartz and Smets, or I'll call it HS, it's easier, uh, is, is down in this quadrant and modified Hartz and Smets is in this quadrant. So that's what happens in Europe. Now, what if all countries implement the same policy as Europe? Uh, except we cannot do a 50 euros a tonne carbon tax in the Middle East because of the economic outcomes are so negative. Um, the model is difficult to solve in that case and keep the Middle East uh, as a single country unit. Um, and so the sector, the same policy is happening across the world. What's interesting is what happens when you compare what happens in the Europe tax. So this is the one I just showed you. So GDP falls gradually over time. In the world tax, GDP in Europe actually rises initially. This is because the impact of the carbon tax, although exactly the same values, have very big differences across countries depending on economic structures. What happens is capital actually flows out of the most impacted countries, very fossil fuel intensive countries like Australia, and they flow into Europe. That'll tend to appreciate the exchange rate increase the capital stock temporarily in Europe, and that means that the global tax has a less negative impact than the European alone tax. And you can see the inflation outcomes are very similar, although the world tax has a slightly higher inflation rate. Here's the story in terms of what's driving this capital flows. Capital flows into Europe for the world tax, which appreciates the real exchange rate. It flows out of Europe when Europe acts alone, which depreciates the exchange rate. That capital inflow is seen in the green line here for the world tax. A trade deficit is an inflow of capital to Europe. A trade surplus is an outflow of capital from Europe. Um, what's interesting too is when you dig down, this is what happens to durable manufacturing. Now, what's interesting here is with the world tax, there is a, an investment slump in all the investment that would have gone into fossil fuel industries. As it turns out, Europe, particularly Germany, exports a lot of investment goods that are made up of durable goods. And so the world tax has a big negative impact on investment and that drives down your durable manufacturing output. But it actually doesn't drive down non-durable manufacturing output. So the sectoral shifts are quite significant. This depends crucially on the assumptions you make about fiscal policy and about the investment incentives to drive renewable energy investment and other uh, non-fossil fuel investments. So just coming to the end, if you compare across the regime, so again, we've used the modified hartsman smets rule here because we prefer that in terms of the uh, inflation output trade-offs. And we look at what have, what's the cumulative effect, just like the impulse response functions I showed you, what are the effects after 10 years? And you can see over across a range of variables, a key one is that the climate shock has a bigger negative impact on European GDP than the European um, trans transition policy, the carbon tax. And actually globally coordinated carbon tax has a much better outcome for European GDP under the assumptions we've made about the policy reaction functions of fiscal policy. And again, the price level effects, you can see under a global carbon tax, you get higher price level effects. You get trade surpluses coming from the European carbon tax, deficits coming from the global carbon tax, and very, very different and negative impacts on investment under the closure that we've assumed in these scenarios. So let me conclude. Um, what we found is historically carbon taxes in Europe have tended to have a short-term positive effect on headline inflation, but the central bank hasn't been able to manage that. 
Um, the impact on core inflation tends to be negative, uh, and that's uh, we find, um, and my co-authors found in a separate paper, it's really a story about changing relative prices rather than a story about the overall price level for a given monetary policy. Um, we find that the outcomes in the short run depend very importantly on what the ECB is doing. Um, and so we, it is, you can get inflation or deflation depending on the policy rule. Um, using current information as well as future information seems to be a much better way of handling these sorts of uh, supply side shocks when they are very much supply side shocks. Um, and inflation in the euro area can be contained in all shocks um, and it, it, the magnitudes we come up with are very similar to the empirical evidence in the first part of the paper. Um, key point is that the largest cumulative negative impacts on GDP is due to physical climate risk, not so much due to transi transition risks from carbon taxation. And you can design the carbon tax policy to give you very, very different outcomes in terms of economic activity and inflation. That's a question about fiscal policy. Um, climate shocks and climate policies tend to reduce the level of GDP. And in the particular examples we've simulated here, you get a slump in global investment, which is front loaded because the investment that would have happened in fossil fuels is now going to have to be brought forward and reinvested in, in sectors that are very small and that very difficult to expand quickly enough to offset the investment slump. It requires additional fiscal support as was shown in the IMF World Economic Outlook in October last year uh, and papers with um, Florent Germain and Larry Liu and myself, um, the, fiscal matter, the fiscal response really matters, particularly in terms of infrastructure investment to turn around this collapse in private investment. So what future research do we think is important? Well, really, I think the coordination of monetary, fiscal and climate policies within regions, within the Eurozone, but also globally is very, very sensitive to this, the sign and the size of the shocks we're talking about. And so really all actors, the central banks need to worry about the fiscal and the climate policies that are being put in place. And each of the other policy makers need to worry about that as well. Uh, and that's the end of my presentation. Uh, more detail on the GQ model can be found at this website. Thank you very much. Well, th thank you so much, Warwick, uh, for this uh, very interesting presentation. And, and I must say, I'm, I'm intrigued by the model analysis showing how monetary policy matters for the way that materializing climate risks transmit through the economy. And, and I'm sure that we can dwell a bit more on this in the discussion. Now, let me take this opportunity to remi remind all of you that during the plenary discussion, participants wishing to comment or ask questions should raise their virtual hands. And your raised hands um, will reach the display that I have in front of me so that I can give you the floor. However, before moving to that, um, I will first give the floor to the deputy governor of Sveriges Riksbank, Anna Bremen, who has kindly agreed to, to, to deliver a discussion of this um, session's paper. So Anna, thank you so much for joining me in this session. And the floor is yours for around 10 minutes. And I was almost afraid that Warwick would stick exactly to the 20 minutes, but um, the one minute that he took extra was, was, was gladly given um, due to the super interesting um, presentation he gave. So Anna, please 10 for you, but maybe if you take one more, that's fine as well. Well, thank you, Frank, and thank you very much for inviting me here today. And a warm thank you to Professor McKibben and to your co-authors, uh, Beatrice Wider de Mauro and Maximilian Conrad for your work on climate change and monetary policy. So climate change is ultimately a scientific question. So to model the economic effects of climate change, we have to start with the physical science. So I would therefore like to show you some results from the latest IPCC report. Uh, climate scientists distinguish between warming of the atmosphere, ocean and land and its complex effect on the climate system. So just the past few months, citizens of Euro area countries have experienced extreme heat, flooding and fire. And climate scientists, they call these kind of events climate impact drivers. When in addition to the three events I just mentioned, the IPCC lists another 32 such climate impact drivers in this report. It looks like this. 
I don't actually expect you uh, to see the details of this slide. I just want to stress the many different channels through which climate change affects households and firms and therefore our economies. This is the physical science. So the economic perspective on climate change is that it stems from a failure to put a price on a negative externality, the emission of greenhouse gases. So the first best policy response is therefore to put a price on carbon, uh, for example, a tax, and this tax should be global. So economists want a climate policy to cause a change in the relative price between goods and services that emit greenhouse gases and those that don't. So now let's combine the physical science with economics. Successful models uh, should combine the complex changes in the climate system with an economic model to estimate the effects on standard macro variables such as GDP, employment, inflation. Uh, and the model should also include transition risks such as the effects of carbon taxes. Clearly, that is no easy task, but that is what uh, Professor McKibben and his co-authors have been asked to do. So let's look at the research presented today. Um, the first empirical part of this paper looks at carbon taxes in the euro area. I think I went too far, right? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, as I've already mentioned, the purpose of carbon taxes is to change uh, relative prices. So I think it's encouraging that this uh, paper finds that uh, carbon taxes in the area has done exactly that. It's changed relative prices rather than the overall price level. However, uh, we should be careful in interpreting this result as indicative of future climate policies and its effect on inflation. So first, of course, uh, and uh, Warwick mentioned this, um, these taxes are low compared to the tax levels needed to meet the commitments in the Paris Agreement. And also these taxes are uh, local. Um, so it means that consumers can easily substitute goods produced locally with imports from other countries with lower or no carbon taxes. Um, so global tax on carbon will give less room for substitutions, but also spur more innovation into new green technologies. So the net effects on consumer prices are uncertain. So that is why we need a general equilibrium type of model with multiple sectors and multiple countries. But that is the second part of the paper presented here today. So uh, I would like to stress and highlight why I consider the most important contributions in this paper and some further research, and I'll do it from a policy perspective, from the perspective as a policymaker. Um, first, um, this model uh, is novel in the respect that it, it estimates the effects on variables that are relevant to central banks, in particular inflation, and it compares different monetary policy responses to climate-related shocks. And it shows that the monetary policy response matter both for output and price dynamic. Uh, but in terms of further research, I would like to see models that include policy tools that are currently used by both the ECB and the Riksbank, Bank, such as large-scale asset policies, uh, large-scale asset purchases, targeted lending, and collateral policies. Um, the other nice contribution of this model is that it simulates both physical risks and transition risks, and it takes the physical science very seriously. It does both um, the, um, uh, the chronic risk from climate change as well as the extreme weather events, but it does the transition risks and the physical risks separately. And as a policymaker, we're already facing a near future where multiple shocks are likely to impact inflation at the same time. And this is um, in particular the, the case with climate change. So let me give you an example to illustrate uh, the challenges that we face as monetary policymakers when multiple shocks happen at the same time. And I'm going to use um, Swedish inflation as an example. Uh, this is CPIF, that's our preferred measure of inflation. You see the developments between 2014 and 2019. Uh, and that's a pretty nice upward trend. And then in 2020, uh, the pandemic hit. So we faced three shocks to inflation at the same time. We had a demand shock due to the pandemic. At the same time, we had supply shocks, which were also due to the pandemic. And in Sweden, we also faced um, a shock to energy prices. Um, 
and it was particularly electricity prices in the beginning of 2020. We had a warm, wet and windy winter and we have a lot of hydropower and wind power. So electricity prices fell sharply. So this is what it's looked like in the past year and a half. We've had more volatility and inflation than the six years prior to the pandemic. This is our current forecast. And this is the contribution from, uh, from energy prices, which is mainly actually driven by electricity prices, not so much global oil prices or gas prices. Um, my main point here is that in real time, it is difficult to distinguish between a rel pri relative price change and an overall increase in the price level. And as a result, it will be difficult when we face multiple shocks at the same time to accurately forecast the persistence of the shock, its second round effects, and its effect on inflation expectations. And this is important when we consider the type of shocks that we're likely to face um, due to climate change. So coming back to this uh, paper, I agree with the conclusion in this paper. We should not uh, tighten monetary policy if we face transitory shocks from either carbon prices or extreme weather events. And we should focus on core measures rather than headline inflation. Um, but even if we do so, we're likely to face some difficult trade-offs in actually setting monetary policy. So uh, some final comments on this paper from the perspective of a, as a policymaker again. Um, one thing I found very interesting in the paper is that uh, the research shows larger effects from physical risks as compared to transition risks. So let me give you some more research and you see that here on the slide on, on the physical risks from extreme weather events. Um, empirical research shows that extreme weather events already have a significant effect on inflation. This is particularly true for uh, developing countries, but there is a paper here by Kim and co-authors that actually show these effects also in the United States. It's a very recent paper. Um, and the effects come through large uh, increases in food and energy prices. And that causes a discrepancy between headline and core inflation, exactly like uh, Professor McKibben could uh, found in his paper. Um, so why is that a challenge to us? Well, I've already mentioned one thing. In real time, it's difficult to distinguish between a relative price change and an overall increase in the price level. But also, uh, we're likely to face high, high volatility. And if we get high volatility in food and energy prices, it makes forecasting more difficult. Um, and it increases the risk of policy mistakes. It extends the time before we accurately um, can adjust policy to meet an inflationary or deflationary trend. And we may sometimes act when the best response is actually to do nothing. And my third point was just probably the most important one. Uh, we can face a credibility problem uh, towards households and firms. So we know uh, that households and firms tend to form inflation expectations um, from, um, from changes in prices of goods and services that are salient. And food and energy prices are typically such, uh, such items. So if we see substantial volatility in food and energy prices, but we as, uh, as policymakers, as central banks, continue to stress core prices. Um, it can cause a large discrepancy between households' inflation expectations uh, and central bank communication. That can severely hurt credibility. And, it, and in the worst case scenario, we risk inflation expectations becoming unanchored. So let me conclude. Um, Monetary policy and climate policies. What are the implications for Europe? Should central banks care about climate change? Well, empirical research shows that um, climate change is already a threat to price stability. So therefore we need to better model, uh, we need to better analyze, and we also have to prepare for difficult trade-offs in setting monetary policy. Because uh, exactly like Professor McKibben showed us, the monetary poli policy response will matter. Uh, Central banks do have an obligation to consider uh, the risk that climate change posed to our economies and act in accordance with our individual mandates, but exactly how we should do that and whether we should also adjust our policy tools to combat climate change. I'm more than happy to discuss that, but I'll leave it for the discussion. Thank you.
you, thank you, Anna, for this very interesting discussion. And, and with that, uh, let us now move to the plenary discussion. And again, please raise your virtual hands if you wish to comment or ask questions to either of the two speakers. And as you are raising your hands, let me just ask Warwick if he wants to maybe break the ice and briefly respond to Anna's discussion. Thank you very much, Frank, and uh, thanks, Anna. Excellent comments. Uh, you raised a number of really important points, one on volatility of prices, one issue which we focused on in a paper that was published in Oxford Review of Economic Policy with Augustus Panton, uh, Peter Wilcoxon and Adele Morris, who's just moved to the Fed to work on climate change inside the Fed. Um, we, we argued that um, the proje projections of potential output will start to uh, deteriorate. And one of the key aspects of inflation forecasting inflation targeting framework is the ability to forecast potential output. And if potential output is difficult to forecast, then central banks will get the forecast on inflation wrong, and that will also undermine credibility. And we're seeing that in the data in the US. The Richmond Fed has a study which shows the forecasting errors of potential output have been, have been much larger in the last decade than in previous decades. So I think that's an important point. Uh, the forecasting capacity um, of central banks, I think they can forecast nominal income better than they can forecast inflation in a climate changing world. And so we argue in that paper that central banks should really be making uh, forecasts of nominal growth and targeting nominal growth. That enables them to decipher between relative price shocks and absolute price shocks. It doesn't really matter for the inflation forecast. So if you if you miss, if you get a negative climate shock and output is lower than you thought it would be, then inflation will be higher if you have achieved your nominal growth target. So I think there's a, a serious debate about shifting the monetary focus from purely inflation targeting to more of a nominal GDP or some other measure of nominal growth. Uh, and I think that's an important issue that I think central bankers should be and probably are debating. Oh, a final point, if I could just um, mention, we do have a full vector of assets in this model. So the share prices of different companies uh, are impacted and central banks could actually do share purchases or other sort of asset purchases. We don't model it in this paper, but in fact, we could model that as part of a future research. It's already in the model. We just don't use quantitative easing or other non-conventional, now it's conventional, but um, we're focusing here on interest rate policy. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Warwick. And, you know, I'm delighted to see that questions are coming in. Um, so I will be calling uh, first on um, Elga Bartsch, uh, who is the head of macro research at BlackRock. And then um, um, maybe I can uh, remind you that, um, you know, the, the, please try to, to stick to one minute, one and a half minutes maybe for your question. After you, Elga, I will go to uh, Diego Kenzi. Uh, but there's room for more questions, so please don't be shy. Elga, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this hugely interesting presentation and also the discussion of it. Um, I just want to reposition the discussion a little bit to say that climate change is real. That means the inflation implications of climate change itself should be our baseline. And then I think from there on, we need to think about how that changes as we are transitioning to a uh, low carbon economy. And I'd be very interested in getting views on what difference it makes, whether we sort of commit to net zero um, and sort of uh, much more aggressive in what kind of changes in relative prices and in the shadow price of carbon we need to achieve. And whether or not the main difference in policy reactions by monetary policy is not really whether the central bank is targeting headline inflation or core inflation. Everything else could just be of second order magnitude in terms of uh, how central banks react to that. Um, so I think um, we can no longer, also when we talk about inflation, um, ignore the fact that our baseline includes already pretty material climate damages and just uh, changes uh, to the inflation baseline. Be very interested of hearing the views uh, both uh, from both speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Elga, and, and thank you for these very, very good questions, but also for breaking the ice. Um, uh, Warwick, can I first uh, turn to you and then maybe uh, after you, uh, Anna would like to chip in as well. 
Yeah, thanks very much for the question. So we actually explored net zero in the IMF World Economic Outlook using this model in October last year, and also in a new research paper that uh, Florence Jamal and myself and Larry Liu uh, put out uh, as an IMF working paper a few months ago. Um, net zero is actually uh, much deeper cuts than we explored in this particular example, um, and getting there isn't isn't difficult as long as you're willing to put in place other policies to stabilise or assist with the adjustment. And that is really a story of fiscal policy primarily and infrastructure investment, fixing the market failures on the pricing of carbon, but also fixing the market failures on the provision of infrastructure capital that enables the climate transition. And monetary policy's role is just to stabilise around that. And I think to, to be careful about the financial instability that can come from stranded assets and the sort of issues that the regulators are worried about. But I think it really is, that's why I said it's fiscal and climate and monetary all have to be coordinated. And the assumptions you make about the reactions of each of those policymakers makes a big impact on the other policymakers. Thank you, Wari. Um, Anna, would you like to also um, answer the questions? Yeah, but I agree with Warwick that fiscal policy um, is going to be the main driver here. But I think as central bankers, we still have to consider how we fit in compared to all these policies that are enacted or will be enacted uh, by, by the political side. And I think it's important that we're not seeing ourselves completely on the sidelines because there's a risk that we actually counteract the policies that are, are, are uh, being enacted by other um, parts of the economic policy making. So if we don't consider, for example, uh, the purchases that we do in terms of large scale asset purchases, we might actually slow down the transition. And we don't want to be on the side of slowing down the trans transition. Um, to put it simply, we have to, we know that our primary mandate is, is price stability. But we have an obligation to consider the risk that we put on our balance sheet. And that gives us, again, an obligation to consider the kinds of assets that we have. And then we also have to consider that we should not actively go against policies enacted by other policymakers. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And now it's my uh, pleasure to turn to Diego Canti, uh, who is a PhD student at London Business School. Uh, you are already on the screen, Diego, but I want to compliment you because I think the more uh, students and PhD students who are here uh, in the virtual audience who actually dare to speak up, the better and the more interesting this will be. So please uh, go ahead and, uh, and, and, and give us your, your thoughts and your questions. Great, thanks so much, Frank. Uh, first of all, let me say very interesting presentation and discussion. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question concerns this uh, finding that I found very intriguing that the monetary policy rule matters a lot for the transmission um, of climate policy. You looked at these two different rules. Did you also consider other rules? And could you also use your framework maybe to study the optimal monetary policy? And then my second question is related to fiscal policy that you also hinted at plays an important role. So there. Can you elaborate maybe a bit more uh, what the effect could be if, these, uh, um, if the revenues are rebated to households, for instance, by lowering taxes or by direct transfers? Thank you very much. Thank you, Diego, for your questions. And maybe again, um, I will keep to the order of first uh, Warwick and then, uh, then Anna. Yeah, thanks. Very good question. So, yeah, there's a lot of different monetary rules that we could consider. Um, my favourite when we've been doing these analyses is a nominal GDP rule because you don't need as much information as you do in an inflation uh, targeting framework. You don't need to forecast potential output as, as well. Um, on the fiscal rule, what's really important is um, what you do with the revenue. So in the paper, we made the assumption that the revenue is used to reduce the budget deficit permanently. And if we change that to lump sum transfers to households, it changes the consumption impacts. If you change it to infrastructure investment, it has a very big impact in the medium term productivity growth of the economy as long as that investment is productive. Uh, and that is all incorporated in the IMF World Economic Outlook chapter, as well as in a number of other papers that are on my website. Uh, revenue recycling matters a lot on, on the outcomes. Thank you, Warwick. Uh, Anna, maybe you want to pitch in as well. Yeah, well, of course, I mean, when we have 
excellent graduate students being interested in this topic, I think I would just like to encourage them to look into all the different kinds of policy tools the central banks are using today uh, to see if we could find different effects and if it matters whether it's large-scale asset purchases or whether it's interest rates changes or if it's targeted lending. I would like to see much more research on this. Uh, so I encourage you to, uh, to follow that road yourself. Very well, and, and a very, very good advice, uh, Anna. Um, next uh, question uh, is going to be asked by uh, Neville Hill, who is the chief European economist of Credit Suisse. And, and, and before you take the floor, Neville, um, uh, let me just say that there is room for more questions. So if there are anyone uh, still under the audience who want to take this opportunity, uh, please don't feel shy. Uh, this is the moment to, um, to, to really contribute. But please, uh, Neville, please uh, go ahead. Great, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for what's been an absolutely fascinating um, discussion. Uh, I guess I'd be interested in what you think the sort of practical consequences for monetary policy will be in terms of you know, what a central bank like the ECB would, would practically do in the event of a substantial increase in uh, carbon taxes and carbon prices. Um, it strikes me that you know one of the key challenges here is to you know, use a monetary policy rule that perhaps focuses on the downside risks to economic output rather than focusing on the, the overshoot of inflation. Um, and so, you know, maybe one idea that I'd be interested in hearing your, your thoughts on is whether, you know, it would be sensible for central banks to articulate in advance what they think the impact of substantial increases in tar carbon taxes will be on growth and inflation, critically, and consequently articulate what their policy response will be in order to uh, allow inflation expectations to remain anchored at the same time as uh, potentially inflation overshoots for a number of years, um, their target, uh, and you know, monetary policy, I guess, remains in a, in a more expansionary direction in order to mitigate the, the negative effects of carbon taxes on growth if you know, we're unlucky enough to have a fiscal policy response that um, you know, you've got in your model where um, you know, policy is effectively tightened. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Neville. Um, uh, Warwick, Anna. Um, well, very quickly, uh, I think um, the, the key issue here, I think, is, is um, the design of the monetary framework. When, when there's rigidities in the economy, this is where the economic costs come from. And the rigidities that, that we're picking up are the stick fixity of physical capital in particular sectors. So when you're changing these relative prices, you stop investing in those sectors, but that capital can't move, it's there, it just loses value. Um, and new investment will go to new sectors. Um, uh, the other issue is if, you, if you're targeting inflation and you have a big spike in one price, then you have to have a contraction in another price to get back to your inflation target. So some sectors are gonna to have to be compressed to get inflation to fall back into target. Um, and so that's an important issue because that combines the elasticities of substitution and, and the ease of moving capital across sectors matter a lot in that case. Uh, and so really, I think, again, if, if, you, if you have either the rule like we have, the modified Hartsman-Smets, which trades off explicitly inflation deviations from target versus uh, output deviation from target, that builds in a, an explicit trade-off. Um, but you can also do nominal income targeting or nominal income growth targeting. And that, to me, is much more attractive in terms of credit, maintaining credibility. And Anna made that important point that the key issue here is central banks don't lose credibility in their monetary frameworks because that will unhinge inflation expectations. Thank, thank you, Warwick. Also, Anna, please, if you want. Yeah, no, but I was going to say that I do think that the most important factor here is actually to keep inflation expectations well anchored. But I do think it can be a challenge. Um, and as I mentioned, that's why I stress that both uh, Professor McKibben and if you look at other empirical research, they, will, they find that the effects from climate change on prices is likely to come mainly through food and, 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 electricity, and energy prices in a wider sense and that is going to be a challenge for us because if you also think about the discussions that we have today on income inequality which households will be the most hit if we see much higher food and energy prices well it will be low income households so we will have to focus on core prices but we will have to communicate 
uh, that we are aware of these changes and hopefully, but that's just a hope, uh, we will see uh, the distribution of the taxes going to the right, uh, being used, the revenues used in the right ways to spur innovation, to spur infrastructure and to transfer those things back to the people that will be the most hurt uh, by these taxes. But we have to be careful because in the end, our mandate is to maintain price stability. So if we see a long period of inflation overshooting the target, um, we'll have to respond to that to keep inflation expectations anchored. So I think volatility is a, is, is a big risk and we have to consider that. And if you know it in advance, it's going to be easier in terms of communication. But it is a, it's, it's a challenge to monetary policy. Thank you, Anna. Um, then I think the next question will go to, um, to Glenn uh, Rudebusch. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a great discussion. Um, I wanted to second uh, something that Frank uh, mentioned about the importance of, of research. Um, central banks have been uh, important uh, sources, uh, important centers for uh, economic research. And um, climate economics, climate finance, climate risk, uh, these are important uh, areas for further research. Um, and I think it's, it's a little hard for central banks uh, in part because uh, even for the economics profession more broadly, because of course, uh, climate uh, implications cut across international labor, investment, consumption, financial markets. Uh, so there's that um, uh, all in um, interdisciplinary uh, nature of, of the work that, that's needed. So um, that uh, I think is important and, and uh, uh, Warwick's work is, is a great step in that regard. More substantively, I also want to agree with um, Anna that uh, we don't, you know, sh how should central banks care about climate change? Um, it's not just a matter of being reactive to output or, or prices um, and to think about output dynamics and price dynamics, but also uh, for many central banks uh, who have a, a more direct motive uh, uh, really to support climate policies as well, that, that all-in government approach. So it's not just a matter of, of reacting, uh, but also, also contributing. And finally, uh, a question for Warwick is, um, uh, you've, you've talked a lot, and, and this was really about monetary policy, but um, there must be a connection uh, with financial policy. So we, we, we've talked a lot about, uh, there's been a lot of traction uh, with regard to uh, climate risk and, and thinking about financial policies uh, uh, to mitigate climate risk. Um, but uh, there might be some interconnection, there's some you know, coordination uh, between that monetary policy and, and, um, and uh, you know, uh, supervisory and, and financial policies as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Glenn. Maybe I can ask um, uh, Warwick and Anna to be very short, and then we can see whether we still have time for one more question or not. But, uh, but please, go, go ahead. Good to see you, Glenn. Thanks for the question. Very briefly, um, carbon taxes aren't my actual favourite way of pricing carbon. Uh, we have a, an approach called the Climate Asset and Liability Mechanism, which focuses on stabilising the balance sheets of firms and households uh, in a way in which the revenue doesn't go to the government, but it goes through the asset markets to the balance sheets. No time to discuss it here, but it used to be called the, the hybrid approach, the McKibben-Wilcoxon hybrid. It's now called the Climate Asset and Liability Mechanism. Happy to send you some material on that. But I think that deals with the issue you've just addressed. Thank you, Warwick. Anna? Well, I very much agree with the point that this kind of research is, uh, is needed and it will help us make better policies when we face greater uh, threats from climate change. But I would like to stress from a central bank perspective, the risk management perspective. Um, we have large balance sheets in many countries now, uh, and we have, we have an obligation to consider the risks on our balance sheets. And climate change is a threat uh, to different kinds of assets, and therefore we have to act in accordance with those risks that we see. One important thing, and that has been done by central banks, is to demand better disclosures from firms, because that will help us in, in, in addressing those risks and making decisions on, on what to put on our balance sheets. Thank you, Anna. Oliver Giesecke is our um, 
next, um, uh, the, 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 we'll ask the next question. Oliver, please. Hi. Um, yes, I actually have a question regarding the model. Um, my understanding is that you're marrying like a traditional economics model with a climate model. And uh, um, this economic model is usually a model with risk neutral agents. So climate risk really strikes me as having certainly like an idiosyncratic component, but also an, an aggregate risk component. So I, I, I suspect if you were to take risk very seriously in the model that you would probably even get a sort of an amplification of your effects that you find through this risk channel and the risk premium that it demands. Thank you, Oliver. Warwick? That's a that's a very good question. We actually do take it seriously. We have risk premia throughout the various arbitrage conditions, um, not derived from the utility function, but put in to make the model replicate the database at a particular year. And in the paper with uh, Fernando and Lou, where we model climate shocks and climate change, we actually model changes in risk premia based on the impact, the historical data on the impact of climate events on stock market values in different sectors in different countries and build that changes in risk premia into the um, into the shocks in addition to the climate shocks. And they're actually, as you suspected, they are actually can be much bigger, in fact, than the climate shocks themselves. Going forward, the historical, we use the historical data to estimate that relationship and then use the, um, the uh, forecast of um, future temperatures to then change the shocks in the future, which have these equity and asset market effects. But it's a very good question. And I referred to that paper that's um, it's on the karma of my website at the Australian National University. Thank you. Thank you, Warwick. Um, um, I'm going to use my privilege as chair of this panel to ignore the time because I see that James Bollard is on the screen. So uh, you are going to have the privilege of having the last question. It's uh, great to see you here. Please, James, go, go ahead. Thank you, Frank, uh, and uh, thanks for the forum. I thought this was a great session. Uh, I just want to encourage uh, Warwick in his uh, research and his co-authors. I think this is uh, uh, really great and it, it serves to focus the issue. There often is a lot of hyperbole around uh, climate issues, but this is really getting down to brass tacks about, uh, you know, how would this transition really work and, and how would the interaction of fiscal and monetary policy work? Um, I love the emphasis on uh, nominal GDP targeting. I myself have tried to emphasize uh, nominal GDP targeting might be a better approach to monetary policy. And I see flexible average inflation targeting in the U.S. as being a step uh, in that direction. Uh, probably not as recognizable as economists would like, but I, I do think it is a step in that direction. And then my question would be, uh, and you've been asked this in several ways, uh, but you know, are carbon taxes really the optimal policy here? So I guess the way I would ask it is, you know, in the long run, does this mitigate the climate risk or stabilize the climate risk or reverse it uh, possibly in the, in the very long run? Um, and uh, I realize you may not be able to say that in the big model, but maybe in some stripped down model with, uh, with the right kinds of transfers back to uh, households and businesses. Um, uh, is this the right fiscal policy mix in this model uh, so that you really, really are talking about optimal uh, monetary fiscal policy? Thank, thank, thanks a lot. Um, Warwick, I will go to you, then we'll ask Anna, and then I'll wrap up and we will end up with Claire. Warwick, please. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jim. It's good to see you. Um, so uh, again, as I mentioned, um, I think if you if you take a broader view than just economic optimal, what you need is a policy that's politically sustainable. And what the climate NASA liability mechanism does is it gives you a credible future carbon price and it creates a political constituency because the, the balance sheets of firms and households have the long-term carbon assets built into them and therefore they're less likely to convince the government to drop the carbon pricing policy. So if you want political credibility as well as economic optimality, I'd refer to the climate asset liability mechanism as a way of achieving that. It, what you'd lose is the revenue that would otherwise be able to be used for infrastructure investment, but you can do a mix of the two. And I think that's important that we don't just fixate on carbon taxes. There are many different ways to price carbon. And I think the climate and asset liability mechanism, in my view, is the best one.
Thank you, Wari. Anna. Well, the key thing is to get uh, a price on this negative externality that we have, which is the emission of greenhouse gases. The exact form has to be decided by politicians, preferably in international agreement. And I agree with Warwick that the key, his, key, key question is to find a solution that is politically sustainable in the longer run. That's it. Well, well thank you. Thank you again, uh, Anna, Warwick, all those who have intervened, who have dared to intervene, have brought their, their thoughts and their questions. Uh, let me just throw a couple of things back to you that I heard. Uh, climate change is real. Um, climate change is a hot topic. We don't want to be on the side of those who slow down the transition. Climate change is a threat to price stability. These were just some of the things that came to the fore in the last very interesting hour in which I think we have brought climate change and if you allow me the climate crisis to the core, to the very heart of central banking. And who would have thought that only three to four years ago and maybe in some time in the future when we look back we will see that not only climate change but also broader biodiversity loss uh, will come part of the debate of central bankers. And with that, I want to thank you a lot and over to you, Claire. Thank you, Mr. Elderson. You did a really excellent job of moderating what was a very, very good session. I'd like to thank Warwick and Anna for doing a supremely good work in terms of building on what we saw last year. I think you saw from the questions, this is an issue that's very much on people's minds. Um, again, I don't envy the task of central bankers. It's yet another thing, along with a very you know, uncertain outlook for inflation in general, that they will have to consider in the policy making process. We're going to take a break right now. We'll return at 16.30 Central European time, where we'll be looking at the impact of unemployment and inequality on the work of central banks. Join us again then.